What's happening, what's happening, what's happening? Of course you know it's your boy B-Hop Radio, shout in, stepping in the building. I got a hip hop icon and legend in this thing. I mean, a business handler. I mean, one of the people behind some of the biggest deals that you could ever even imagine. We're going to get into that in this interview as well. She finds artists. She puts them in the game. She also helps people to navigate the game at the same time. I'm talking about my sister, Wendy Day, and this thing. What's good with it, sis? How you feeling? I feel awesome. How are you? Oh, Wendy, first of all, it is a pleasure to have you in this thing. I thank you so much for stopping by and hollering at me in here. Oh, my God. I love you. I'd be here regardless. Thank you. I'm a phone call away, baby. Exactly. Wendy. When it comes to you and hip hop, can you tell me what was it that just snatched you up and got you ready to go for it? The music. Uh-huh. I started listening to hip hop in 1980. You weren't even born yet, were you? 83. Okay. okay. Yeah, I was on the way. You were in the way. Yeah. You, there was, you were a gleam in somebody's <laughs> eye. Okay. <laughs> So in 1980, I went to a concert at University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Uh and Grandmaster Flash was the opening act. Mm -hmm. And when they took the stage, I was just like, huh? Yeah. And I fell in love, the energy and the passion. And that led me to start going to the record store in Philly, because it was, you know, records back then. Yeah. It started me going to the record store to find out what is this music? Like, who mm-hmm. are these guys? That's and right. I made friends at the record store mm-hmm. and the guy who worked there was getting cassette tapes. That's how long ago it was, right? <laughs> I know. Cassette tapes mailed through the dinosaur system, <laughs> mailed to Philadelphia, and then the guy would bootleg them. He would copy them and sell them out of the record store. Mm-hmm. So I was getting live tapes from New York City Ooh. of like Busy B battling and mm-hmm. all these different Cold Crush, all these different um, incredible groups. And mm-hmm. I just fell in love with the music. And I was in corporate America back then, mm-hmm. around 87, so fast forward to, to 1987, mm-hmm. I went to New York for a weekend with one of my girlfriends and we heard a radio show, the Mr. Magic and Marley Ma radio show. Mm. And I fell so in love with that radio state with that radio show on a Friday and a Saturday night that I decided I had to live in New York. Mm. So I went home, quit my job, packed up the U-Haul and moved to New York city by myself. And I regret nothing, like it was awesome. I got to be in Manhattan, going to the clubs and being part of the music, not working in music, Mm -hmm. but it became part of my life. And I embraced hip hop. I loved the b-boying, I loved the graffiti. I loved everything about it. And I became part of the culture. Mm -hmm. I then ended up going to Montreal and working for a liquor company for three and a half years and came back to New York. And at that point in time, I had enough money to be able to choose what I wanted to do. Come on now. And I chose to work with rappers. I, it, it was my passion. So I started a not-for-profit organization called Rap Coalition and started pulling artists out of bad deals. And it was, um, it was like my way of giving back to artists for the years of happiness that I got from I the music. I feel you. You know? I feel you. And that was in 92. And here we are, you know, 29 years later, and I'm still doing the same shit. Who were the first artists that Disaster you had to tempo bring? tempo off of Def Jam. I love that you <laughs> asked that. Nobody asks me that. Exactly. Nobody asks me yeah. that. Disaster tempo. They were signed to Def Jam. Mm. Pulled them out of, that was the first time I ever pulled somebody out of a bad deal. Yeah. And what was really cool is Dizazz went on to design most of the urban fashion that people started wearing in the 90s. He designed for Fat Farm. He designed for, oh God, everybody, Maurice Malone. Yeah. Um, everybody. He just, he became that guy. Yeah. Aniche, he designed so much, Sean John. I wore all that stuff. I know what you're talking about, Wendy. Yes, yes. And we're still friends to this day. Isn't that cool? Oh, my God. So my question would be, that first deal that you had to pull him out of, what was that like doing it for the first time, though, Wendy? Oh, it was scary as fuck. Exactly. Can I, can I curse? Say what you okay, feel. Good. So it was scary because I didn't really know what I was doing, I, and I was so self-righteous because mm-hmm. it's like, you know, and Russell's an icon. So here I am. My first thing is I'm pulling an artist off of Def Jam, off of Russell's label. Yeah. You know, and this is in 92 or 93. It was very early. It was 92, very early in my career. And 
I was able to do it because I had a relationship with an accountant called Bert Padell. Mm -hmm. And Bert was the one that acted as the go-between to actually get the contract and get Russell to agree to let them go. Mm. And then once I did one, it was like, oh, pfft, I got this. Exactly. And then it became easy. And the hardest part has always been finding the artists because everybody thinks they're getting fucked, right? Yeah. But there are some artists where they really are being taken advantage of. Yeah. And then there's other artists where they just decide they don't want to be at the label anymore. Mm -hmm. So the hard part was figuring out of everybody that said they needed help who really needs help. Yeah. And then from there I started, cause just pulling somebody out of a bad deal isn't enough. Mm -hmm. I started learning how from all the bad deals that I was seeing, I started learning what a good deal was and how to get somebody into a good deal. And the first artist that I ever got to help get into a good deal was Master P. And, and see, that was a really nice first deal. What is a good deal? deal a good deal is where everybody's making money everybody's happy the goals are clearly stated mm. and everybody's achieving their goals whether it's the label or the artist okay that would be a good deal when you met master p and it was time to help him broker this deal what was going on how did you meet him and what was the deal that was on the table absolutely um i met him i had pulled a group called the chameleons off of um Lumalia's label, and I can't remember the name of it now. Was it Fourth and Broadway? I think it was Fourth and Broadway. I pulled them out of a out of a bad deal. They were just shelved. Yeah, and they were like my favorite group at the time. They reminded me a lot of like De La Soul and that mm. whole funky vibe yeah. that De La had. And the manager's cousin was working for Master P, so mm. I met him through his cousin. And he said to me, you know, this guy is shopping a deal for us and it looks like it's gonna go to Priority Records, but the guy was the manager of EA Ski who was signed to Priority Records. Mm -hmm. So his concern was the guy negotiating the deal was a little too close to the label and he That's didn't right. know if it was fair or not. And it was, mm -hmm. it turned out to be very fair. It turned out to be a great deal but they didn't know that. So they brought me in to sort of ride in the back seat and yeah. play a role, like a small role as part of the team. And what I learned from that was, A, I can do it, yeah. right? Because once you do something, you know you can do it. That's right. But I learned that, the second thing I learned was, I'm really not good as part of a big team. Mm. Like one or two other people, yes. But when there's a whole lot of opinions on something, it that. makes it hard because that. there were like seven people involved in this and it had to be hard for the guy that was that was the main guy. Cause yeah. it's like, just let me do my job. Like what are all these fucking people giving me input, you know? Shit. But it was a great first deal. He got to own his masters, which was a wonderful thing. It was an 80-20 split, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. It did grow to be an 85-15, but at that time, I think it was an 80-20, and I think it was a $600,000 advance. So mm. it enabled No Limit to get back on their feet financially and start selling records or CDs at that time. And, you know, through priority, they were still independent, but they had somebody that was well connected that could help them get the music into stores, show them how to do it, you know, the the corporate way, because mm -hmm. they were just out here gorilla with it, right? Yeah. But they were having trouble getting paid. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that priority was able to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. They had a great sales team, and some of the guys on the sales team are still my friends to this day. Yeah. You know, they were able to get P to the next level so that he could expand outside of just California. And that was the goal. What did you think about that deal? Because that deal went down in history as an unprecedented deal as well. So when you first laid your eyes on it, what was going through your mind? I didn't look at it as unprecedented. Mm -hmm. I looked at it as, as what was owed to Master P. I came uh, in it, I came in it from that artist perspective. Mm -hmm. Like he had sold 300,000 plus units, right? Mm -hmm. He had put out um, Down South Hustlers, West Coast Bad Boys. He had put out a lot of projects and he was coming right after that with TRU, which was his brother, C Murder, um, as part of the group, Mia X mm -hmm. and um, his own stuff, you know, mm -hmm. um, Ice Cream Man, there was a bunch of stuff yeah. coming. And it was exciting because I saw P as the one that was doing like all of the work. Like he mm -hmm. was doing 
a buttload of work. So yeah. I saw it like, well, this is the way it should be. It should be an 80-20 split. Plus, I had just read this book, and this has really nothing to do with music, but yeah. I read this um, biography on Lucille Ball, mm. and I learned how when she started her own company, they filmed everything themselves. They didn't go to a studio Production and let the studio, studio yeah. fund everything. They did it independently, and then they sold um, a percentage of what they own. So I'm like, well, if Lucille Ball can own her master, so can Master P. Exactly. He's entitled. <laughs> you know, it's a white entitlement. Like, he's entitled. <laughs> he should get to do that. Yeah. And that's where that came from. So from there, I was able to go on and do a, a joint venture for Twista. I worked with Do or Die. Do or Die, Poe Pimp was the first single I'd ever put out. And I learned at a, at, a, at a trade show of all places. I learned how to do it at a trade show that took place in Baltimore. I hopped on a plane to Chicago and went and said, hey, I just learned how to do this, let's do it. Yeah. So here's all this hubris from me thinking, I got this, Yeah. you know, from a, a weekend course. And they just had the music that took it out of here. What was it like when Do or Die's Pope Pimp went crazy? Because that is personally one awesome. of my favorite songs of all time. Is it really? Yeah, that was one of my favorite songs. Oh. Man, the boys got biz on that. Yeah. What was it like when you heard that song? You said, okay, they're coming out the Midwest with it, and it's about to go all the way down, and I, I got to work this record. Yes, I thought it was amazing because the fans really embraced it. And then there was a DJ called Pink House who's since passed away, mm. but Pink House really embraced that song, and he started playing it on the radio in the mix show. Back then, rap on the radio meant mix show. Right, yeah. it was Friday night, Saturday night, and that was it. So he was playing it on the mix show, and that was just taking it like to the next level. And the fans embraced it; people were buying it, and mm -hmm. it was exciting because we knew that our hard work was leading to that. That's you know? right. And we were pressing up CDs, and we were getting into the stores. Yeah, you know, and and doing all selling them out of the trunks of the car. And then we got it to a point where it was doing so well that the label started calling. And then mm. I got to negotiate. I thought I was gonna get to negotiate a deal for them. I was in the middle of negotiation. They went to Houston for a weekend and came home signed to rap a lot. But it featured an artist called Twista Ooh, on the song. Yeah. And the label that put them out just they were like, okay, you can sign to rap a lot. We have no problem with that. Yeah. They just pivoted and started working Twista, and we ended up getting him a joint venture at Atlantic. Okay, so what was that like seeing Twista early in his career and understanding that, okay, we got the talent right here. We got to get you a deal. What were the things that needed to take place in order for that to be successful? I love that you asked that because nobody ever asked that. Um, three things uh -huh. needed to take place. One, the proper funding. And most people don't have the proper funding to do this right. Mm -hmm. They'll have 10 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand it takes like over a hundred thousand dollars to do this properly and they happen to have that they were backed by three street guys mm -hmm. that came together and that doesn't mean you need street guys to do this <laughs> exactly. this you was get, just 96 yeah. that's what it was so three street guys came together and put their money into this mm -hmm. and partnered to create a label called creator's way mm. and that label is what helped twist to get to the next level okay so you have to have the money to do it properly you have to have a, a fan base where people will embrace an artist who isn't known yet. Mm -hmm. And Chicago had that. They were happy to embrace their own. Exactly. You know, uh, there are cities where if you're not super famous like Drake is today, they don't they don't support. Yeah. But Chicago happened to support Do or Die and Twista yeah. and the underground movement. Mm -hmm. And that, that needs to take place. And then the third thing you need is to have some sort of an industry. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, mm -hmm we had a DJ called Pink House who was willing to play it on the radio to help spread it. Yeah. We had promoters in Chicago, and I lived in New York at the time, I was the outsider, mm -hmm. right? But we had promoters that would give him shows and let him perform. So there was enough of an industry to support what Creator's Way was trying to do, mm -hmm. and then we just took it to the next level. So after getting Twisted his deal, what was next on Wendy's radar? Eminem. Oh, okay. Yep. See, finding a young Eminem, the Rap Olympics, am I correct? Yep. What was it like when you saw him coming with those bars and you it said something has to happen, but did you think he was going to turn out to be Eminem no. at that no, moment? No, I knew he was going to be big, but I didn't know he was going to be as big as Eminem got. No, no, nobody knew. Nobody knew. In fact, when I was shopping his deal, the reason I did Rap Olympics is I couldn't find a label that would sign a white boy who could rap. 
they just kept playing him to the left. My and God. the real funny thing is when I first started shopping his deal, I burned CDs in my home of his demo, right? Mm -hmm. And I dropped off packages to every label. Well, something went wrong in the burning process and I burned blank CDs, <laughs> which apparently I still do. <laughs> no, no, Wendy, no. But all of his demo CDs were blank. I didn't know this. So I'm taking them around to all the labels and only one label called me, which means only one label listen to that CD Damn. and it was Rich Isaacson at Loud Records. He mm -hmm. called me and said, yo, did you mean for this CD to be blank? And I'm like, it's blank. And he's like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, how embarrassing, right? <laughs> so I had to get, I had to burn new CDs, yeah. take them back to everybody. Okay, the other CD didn't work. Here, here's, yeah. a, here's a proper CD, <laughs> but they all passed because at that point in time, um, Millie Vanilli had just been stripped of their Grammys and Vanilla Ice was yeah. not doing as great as, as people wanted him to in the black community. And mm -hmm. white rappers just, it was very hard. And the labels were like, no, we don't want to be the one. So we tried getting him a write up in the source. That didn't help. We did Unsigned Hype. That didn't help. And we just couldn't get him any traction. So at that point in time, music was going from being lyrical on the underground like backpack type rap uh -huh. to gangsta and more mainstream more yeah. like the bad boy type huh. rap yes yeah. and those of us who were the purists didn't yeah. like that so yeah. i decided to do an event called rap olympics mm -hmm. to bring attention and press to the really lyrical guys to show the world that they're still there that's right and to showcase eminem because he's lyrical Thanks. and it worked it got him signed to to Dre, to Interscope, to Aftermath. During the time where you were trying to shop his demo and you were catching all of that hell, what was M's personality and mental like at that time? And what was your thoughts? Were you thinking, we're going to make this work? Or, you know what, M, I'm going to get this one more. We're going to get this Rap Olympics one day. I'm trying, and you know no, what you out. There was No, it was never like, if this doesn't work, fuck it. It was like, okay, this we're going to try this. If this doesn't work, we'll try something else. Mm -hmm. So he was in Detroit. I was in New York. He was still trying. So he pressed up, I think it was called Infinite. It was, a, um, it was an EP with, it was basically his demo. Mm -hmm. It was an EP with like five or six songs, and he was giving them out everywhere he went to so music conventions. Um, I mean, this is a nine month period of time from yeah. when I met him to rap Olympics. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like we just said, oh, well, and sat back and did nothing. We kept trying to get him a deal. Exactly. And then finally, he finally got a deal at Aftermath. And then it took like another two years before he came out. Like it seemed to take forever. Damn. Yeah, it was crazy how long it took. What was that process like? So now you done spent the time trying to make it happen, but now you had to hurry up and wait. It was frustrating uh -huh. because remember, I'm the chick that pulls people out of bad deals when they get shelved. Ooh. And my fear was that he was getting shelved, Ooh. you know, but on knowing what I know now, I'm thankful because enough time passed to, for the for the industry to shift mm. from white guys can't rap to oh maybe it'll be kind of cool to have a white guy that can rap that's right you know and and it was a different time when he was ushered in and it led to his success mm -hmm. and he's lyrical anyway I mean he would have stood out regardless thanks you know but I remember that when he I remember when his album finally dropped mm -hmm. um, there was a mixtape that dropped first by Stretch Armstrong mm -hmm. and it featured Eminem I remember when that dropped the reaction to it was just like out of here like mm. people were so excited that this new rapper had dropped mm -hmm. there was none of the like it just quelled all my fears like the fear of oh people won't embrace him because he's white when mm -hmm. they see him they'll reject him none of that exactly none of that another artist is uh tupac shakur mm -hmm. and when you met him you didn't like him i didn't what was it about him that pissed you off wendy he was so loud and he was so <laughs> like he was always in the center of any drama and I lead a very drama free life. Like if there's drama, I'm going the other way. Yeah. There were times where he'd be acting a fool, like 
in the line to get into the club and I'd be like, I'm going home. And I didn't know him. It was just like, man, I don't want to be anywhere where this guy is yeah. because the crowd's going to get hype and some shit's going to exactly. blast off. And I just don't want to, I just don't want to be in that. I want to mm. be home working. Right. That's right. So when I first met him, mm. I just kept my distance. I wasn't really a fan of his music. Mm. I really just felt like, okay, if he blows up, that's great. But, you know, I'm going to pay attention to all these lyrical guys exactly. over here, the Raz <laughs> yeah. and what up, the Mad Lads yeah. of the world, right? Yep. And as, um, as, as luck would have it, um, he got into some legal trouble and I was paying attention to his interviews. Mm. I was saying, you know, in, in rap, there were only but so many artists back then. Exactly. So you could really pay attention to what everybody was talking about. That's right. It wasn't like today where it's, you know, just a, a bunch of noise and you have to kind of pick <laughs> and choose, up. right? Yeah. Back then it was like, if you were into rap, you knew who everybody was, whether you That's liked true. him or not. And I was hearing his interviews and he was talking about how he was out here alone and he felt like people were ganging up on him. Mm. and. I kind of got the victim feel from yeah. him and I felt badly. So I had a relationship with the fruit of Islam in New York. I have a relationship with the nation of Islam in Chicago. I had pulled DA smart off of RCA records yeah. and DA was managed by the minister's son, Mustafa. Mm. So I had a relation already with the nation and I just felt like if anybody could protect Tupac, the fruit of Islam could. Mm -hmm. So I called in a favor to a friend of mine that was at, you know, FOI mm -hmm. and they were happy to secure him. And I did it under the pretext of nobody would ever find out. It mm -hmm. would just, you know, he'd be taken care of and that's fine. Well, somebody must have told him because he wrote me a letter thanking me mm -hmm. for helping him. And in the letter, he said to me, um, nobody's ever gone this far out of their way before because they were a fan of my music. But Wendy, you got to talk about the time in which you sent the fruit over there to protect them. What was going on though? Well, there was just a lot of struggle on his part. Mm -hmm. He was up against a street dude who was very powerful, who was trying to crush him. Mm -hmm. And he just didn't really have any support what he felt was support from anybody on the East coast. Mm -hmm. He really did. I mean, he ended up checking himself out of the hospital after what happened at quad studios exactly. and staying at Jasmine guy's house. So he did have people that were helping him. Mm -hmm. He just didn't have the support of someone to protect him or at least where he felt protected mm -hmm. before going to prison, before going to jail. And that's what the fruit of Islam did. So when he finally was sentenced and went to jail a few days later, you know, he, I guess, was told that I had helped him out yeah. and he sent me this letter. And when I got the letter behind, like I'm a big fan of honesty and reality. Yeah. Right? And when I read that letter, I'm like, Motherfucker, I didn't do this because I'm a fan. I don't even like your music. What the fuck are you talking about? So yeah. I wrote him a letter and said, dude, you're loud. You're obnoxious. Yeah. I'm not a fan. Mm -hmm. I did it because I felt I felt that you were out here alone. And I just yeah. didn't feel like anybody should be out here alone. And as the woman that runs Rap Coalition, I felt it my job to That's protect you because you're a rapper. So I sent him off the letter and I'm like... That's that. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, like a week later or 10 days later, I get a letter back from him. I see the return address from Rikers and I'm like, uh oh, <laughs> here it comes. Yeah. And I thought he was going to blast on me. Like, yeah. fuck you. Wait, you're not my fan. Fuck you. Who are you? Who do you think you are? White bitch. Oh! And it wasn't that at all. Mm. He's like, I totally get why you would say that. Yeah but just understand that I'm not that guy. Like, I know you saw me loud, but I was with my friends and sometimes we get loud and I know you see the, the media portrayal of me and I swear to God, that's not me. Like, I'm not the guy that, that shoots cops in the ass, you know? <laughs> I was defending somebody that, that, that was in a bad situation. They were undercover cops, they never. So here he is like explaining to me, not like, not trying to change my mind, but just like, explaining mm. why I was wrong. And I loved that. Mm -hmm. Like, and I'm like, wow, he really is a good dude. Cause he really could have come at me. Exactly. And he didn't. And I'm like, wow, this is such a good dude. And then he explained to me his own situation 
and how he trusted the people around him and he was dead broke and he was mm. in a fucked up position. Yeah. And the rap coalition heart in me was just like, first of all, he, yeah, I was wrong about him. He really is a cool dude and I need to help him. And we became friends from that. I'm gonna go deep into Tupac, but I got a question that I have to ask right now while it's on my mind. The rap coalition finds these artists in their valleys, okay, when it's real in the field. What artist handles the valleys the best and which artist handled the valleys the worst? I think the ones, do you want like exact examples? Because yeah. like, I think Young Buck has handled his valley beautifully. Like, yeah. I just feel like he's been shit on so much mm -hmm. and it hasn't squashed him. Like a lesser man would have slit their wrist by now. <laughs> Come you on know? now. Like he's been through it yeah. and he's so strong and he's emerging like victoriously, you know, yeah. like maybe not victoriously, but he's, he's, back. he's, he's, he's doing his thing. Exactly. You know, his goal is to make music and make money for music. And he is somehow, Come on you know, now. um, the ones that don't handle it well, I can't exactly think of an example offhand, mm -hmm. but it would be someone who just felt like this is what I want to be doing and this is my only outlet. So I'm going to have to cower and take whatever offer the label mm. is offering me. I remember pulling somebody off of Relativity Records and every time I got close to negotiating like a, a, a deal to get him away, the label would cut him a check for five grand. Mm. And then he'd stop taking my calls and he would disappear for like six months, eight months, nine months. <laughs> and it's like, what the fuck happened? And then as soon as the money was gone, yeah. back ringing my phone. And that's one of the, that's one of the rules that I had for and still have for myself. Mm -hmm. I don't go and find the artists mm -hmm. that are unhappy. They have to find me. I feel that. I don't want to be that chick that's just in there like fucking up everybody's <laughs> life, right? <laughs> so, Here come Wendy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I feel so, you. Unless they really want out of their deal, mm -hmm. I tend to just, you know, go about my business. Mm -hmm. And he would, you know, we'd go back in and they'd cut him a check and then he would disappear. And it got to be like by the third time I was like, no. <laughs> so on the third time when he came back and he's like, no, this time it's for real. It's like, well, dude, I'm working for free here. So yeah. I get why you're, I get why you're frustrated. But if you just keep taking these tiny handouts, not only are you owing them more, yeah. But it's just prolonging the problem. We're not fixing the problem. That's right. You're just putting a Band-Aid on it. Exactly. And eventually we got to the point where we understood that we were able to get him out of the deal. It was the first time I ever had to agree contractually that an artist would pay a certain amount of money to give back money once they got out of the deal. But at that point, that's what we had to do because so much was taken, you know, when he was... Playing around. Playing around or disgruntled. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So um, that would probably be an example of somebody that didn't do well mm -hmm. at the down periods because they didn't see the longer, they just wanted their needs met immediately. Mm -hmm. Knowing Tupac while he was in jail during that time, Wendy, did you think he was about to come out of jail and turn all the way up? Or did Absolutely. you think, talk to me. Absolutely. I mean, that was a given. He he was so, he had so much to say. Mm -hmm. He was so prolific. He had written so much mm -hmm. while he was incarcerated that when he came out, the plan was for him to go to the next level. Yeah. He did a three album deal with Death Row. He had delivered um, two albums at that point. The second one hadn't come out yet. That's right. And he knew what the third one was going to be. It was going to be called One Nation. He was dividing everybody East Coast versus West Coast, but the third album was going to bring everybody back together. Mm. He had already started recording it. He had gotten, um, I think, Buckshot from, um, uh, what was it? the Beat Miners the group mm. with Evil D? Yeah. Um, he had gotten him to record. He had gotten a few people to record already when he was, when he was murdered. Um, but I was in the process of, of putting together the business plan and actively shopping him a deal at that point when when he died. And that's just heartbreaking. 
Exactly. You know? Talk to me about that time right there. What was going through Tupac's mind while you were trying to put this label and shop it for him so he could get up out of there and do what he needed to do? He, what were the plans? He, well, the plan the plan was for him to start his own company, but yeah. he was at death row because death row protected him. He felt uh, like Suge was the power guy on the West Coast, mm -hmm. and he was having issue with the East Coast. Like, he thought... And it wasn't accurate, but it's what he thought. He thought that the East Coast um, uh, powers that be were 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 grouping together mm. to squash him. Mm. And first of all, we had no unity on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. That was that was not real. Like there was never a time where Andre Harrell, Puffy, and Russell Simmons were coming together to squash anybody. Yeah, you know they couldn't even start their own fucking distribution, <laughs> right? Let alone <laughs> use it for evil, right? Yeah. yeah, So they couldn't use it for good. They certainly couldn't <laughs> use it for evil. So his, but that was his vision of what he was fighting. Mm -hmm. So he felt Suge could protect him, and Suge obviously did yeah. up to some point. Um, Suge was able to protect him. We were shopping a deal so that he could start his own record label, but it also had community centers attached. Mm. It had daycare centers attached in major metropolitan areas. Like it was so much, it was called um, euthanasia. Yeah. It was such, it was so much bigger than what anybody had ever done. And I was so, like, it It just spoke to me. Like, yeah. it's what I believe. It was, you know, it had educational components and it wanted to educate artists on how to structure their lives, not just their record deals. Like, it was just so amazing. It was a, the next level to what I was trying to do. What was that like for you, Wendy, being able to work on that project? It was at that amazing. Time? It was just absolutely amazing. And then when he passed away, it was like, oh fuck. And Damn. and when he first got shot, like it never crossed my mind that he would die, because he had withstood so much. Yeah. And he had and he had like been through so much mm -hmm. successfully, right? Yeah. So when he first got shot, I FedExed him a get well card. And my thinking was, well, this will slow us down for a couple months, <laughs> you know, while he's, while he's recuperating. Better, yeah. And then when I got the call the night before saying they were going to take him off of life support Shit. and he was dead, I was like, no. And then it, I didn't hear it announced. Like I was awake that whole night, like crying and upset and a little drunk. Of course. And nobody announced it and i'm like well there's hope yeah. so there was a glimmer of hope for like six hours and then it was announced that he was dead and it was like oh fuck, it was true he really was dead damn and it was heartbreaking for you being a person that is up close and personal with a lot of these artists especially when you go through these valleys with them you know the people that struggle together just born it brings us whole nother bond into the situation yes. What is that like for you when you see different artists meeting these untimely demises? It's it's you really know. hard because you know it's preventable. You know, uh, especially because I'm yes. older than than especially now. Like I'm way older than many of these artists, so I'm wiser and I see yeah. things from a different vantage point. And I realize that you know a scuffed shoe or somebody not liking you is not reason to take a life. You know, but at 16, 17, 18, 19, it can seem that exactly. that's it. It could seem like the world is against me when, you know, when you get a little bit of wisdom, you realize it's Ain't nobody understand you. Yes, yes. <laughs> you realize that sometimes just one conversation <laughs> can change everything, you know, and, and that's really different than, you know, loading a gun and sh taking a shot. Yeah. So not to mention the people that you might miss and hit, you know, all the all the entourage the or, or children that's, yeah. that's around them that could get hurt. So. I just, I always saw things a little bit differently because I was older. I was 30 when I yeah. started in the music industry. Mm -hmm. And most of my contemporaries were in their 20s. So mm. I was just at a different stage in, in life, life and a different yeah. point of view. And I was always about education and learning and reading. So, you know, when Pac was locked down, I sent him books. When Pimp C was locked down, I sent him books. You know, Capone, um, when whenever an artist went to prison i'm sending them books every week so that they can develop their own minds not just not just rappers like even the guys behind the scenes you know the the meech from bmf yeah. you know calvin klein from not the designer calvin klein from new york, new york who was a yeah. street dude like 
you know, I'm holding these guys down with knowledge so that when they come out, they don't have to do the same shit. Exactly. And repeat the same mistakes they've already made. Yeah. They can come out and start real business, you know, be put their skill set to work to benefit themselves, their families, and their community. And that's always been the goal. You spoke about Pimp C, UGK, mm -hmm. the bun and the pimp. What was it like working with them? Um, I was closer to Chad, to Pimp C, mm -hmm. than to Bun B. Um, it was a roller coaster ride with him because drugs were involved. So uh. with him, it was, you know, the 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 high highs and the super lows. He was yeah. probably also bipolar. Yeah. But we didn't know that back then. You know, we didn't really understand <laughs> what that was back then or what, you know, mental illness was or even how to medicate it, mm -hmm. you know, how to balance it out. So he was always self medicated. Yeah. So it was it was rough working with him because I would get these calls at like two o'clock in the morning and he'd want to stay on the phone till 6 a.m. Just mm. just talking, you know, and I did it with him because I loved him dearly. But after a while, it just became so draining. It would be the same conversation over. It, it felt like Groundhog Day, the movie, <laughs> where it was like, man, we're talking about the same shit and the same issues. Like, dude, you've got to get it together. And before he passed, he passed in December, I think December 4th. And um, Labor Day weekend before he passed, I flew down to Houston to spend time with him. And he left, kept leaving me sitting in Hotel Icon waiting for him mm. like four days in a row. And finally, I just went home and I'm like, you know, fuck it. Call me when you get your shit together. Yeah. And that was the last time we spoke before he passed away. I stopped taking his calls because like, dude, if you can't even meet, meet me. with me to like help you get yeah. your shit together, like there's nothing I can do. And I have you know? time. I got stuff exactly, I gotta do. exactly. And that was very frustrating because when he passed, it was like, oh, shit, I can't go back and fix that. You know, <laughs> I can't go back and fix that. And I know he loved me, so it yeah. wasn't that that wasn't the issue. It was just it was just the whole drug thing. Like, I can't fight somebody that's high all the time. Yeah. You know, and then that became my trigger. Mm. Like, I have so I am so intolerant of people that that choose drugs over life. Exactly. You know? I'm so intolerant of it. What was it about Pimp C that drew you to him? And what was it, what was his star quality that you noticed in him as well? That he just really wanted to help people. He was very loving, he was very kind. I met him, um, I flew out to a festival in Ohio and I met him in Too Short. Um, Jay Z was there. It was a, it was a huge festival, like in the middle of bumfuck nowhere, <laughs> outdoors, right? Yeah. And um, I met his mom first, Mama Wes, mm. and she said to me, "Oh, please go upstairs, Chad. You know, Chad's been wanting to meet you. Um, he's upstairs. He's in room whatever four twenty, right? Mm. So I go upstairs, and he answers the door in just his boxer shorts, <laughs> and <laughs> as a female in rap." <laughs> We are well trained yes. that you do not go. First of all, you do not go into a man's hotel room exactly. because it means something completely different than I'm here on business. That's right. Not to mention a guy in boxer, boxer shorts, shorts. And I'm, I'm in the hallway hesitating. And he's like, come in. And then he lets the door <laughs> shut. And I'm still not moving. He opens the door. He's like, are you coming in? <laughs> And I'm like, oh, this could go really, <laughs> like, is this gonna be a day that I resent yeah. and always remember like, man, I yeah. shouldn't have done that. Or is this gonna be a day where he doesn't let me down and I feel like, man, what a great, exactly. what a great day that was. And I chose to go in yeah. and it turned out to be what a great day that was, <laughs> you know, cause it could have gone either way. It could have been ugly, you know, in, in rap, you just don't know. Exactly. But he was super respectful. We talked for hours. He went and did the show. I got to go backstage at the the show mm -hmm. um i got to meet too short for the first time that that night and it was just amazing and we bonded immediately because we both just really cared about people mm -hmm. and you know he's somebody that who also when he went to, to to prison to jail i was sending him books and held him down you know david banner did as well yeah held him down while he was incarcerated so when he came out he was super sober mm -hmm. because you know he had been locked down for for, for so long. That's right. And it was just, it was much easier to work with him when he was sober. It didn't last very long, mm. but that's okay. You know, we were able to get some of the stuff um, 
fixed for him that needed to be fixed. What were some of the things that y'all were working on at that Getting time? his publishing back. Okay. Um, Jive owned their publishing 100%. There Ooh. were just some issues yeah. with with them and their, and their label. Um, and that's right when um, Jay Prince from Rap A Lot stepped in and was able to help them get to the next level as well. So there were there were some issues that needed to be resolved, and we were able to do that. Working with folks like Pimp C and Tupac that were, you know, in different beefs with different artists and stuff like that. What was that like being around them during those times? It, it wasn't weird because you got to remember at that point in time, everybody had a beef with somebody. <laughs> you know, this was rap and rap just <laughs> yeah. had beefs and it, beefs didn't lead to death at that point. They mm. led to, you know, a fist fight or people yeah. calling each other out on wax or yeah. whatever. But it wasn't a deadly thing it yeah. wasn't and it was normal mm -hmm. you know having beef was like having dreads you know it's just <laughs> some people had them some people didn't you know it was just it was just the way music was back then that's right david banner another I artist that you work with, with yeah how did y'all link up um he actually hitchhiked to new york he was in a bad record deal with penalty records he was frustrated mm -hmm. and he hitchhiked from um Louisiana, I think he was going to school at Southern. So he hitchhiked from Southern up to my apartment in New York. I had just finished the deal with Cash Money. Yeah. I had just done their deal at Universal. And he showed up on my doorstep and he said, I need help. Mm -hmm. And that was how we met. You know, he showed up in a straw hat mm -hmm. and overalls with no shirt on <laughs> underneath. And he had a, a revolver tucked in his, in his, you know, in his overalls. <laughs> and he was just so country standing on my doorstep in Soho. Yeah. And I'm like, mm, who are you? <laughs> and he's like, I'm part of a group called Crooked Letters. And I'm like, okay, well, it was late in the day. I'm like, we'll come back tomorrow. That's right. You know, like I, I've got meetings and I've got some stuff to do. But if you come back first thing in the morning, you know, we'll we'll meet. I didn't know that he didn't have a place to stay. So he went and stayed in the park mm. overnight, which is just brave as fuck, right, yeah. in New York City. And he, he was back on my doorstep at like 8.15 in the morning. And mm. I'm not an 8.15 kind of girl. So he woke me up the next morning and he came back in and I'm like, you know, this is kind of early. What are you doing here? And he's like, well, I didn't really have a place to stay and I couldn't really kill time because people were starting to come into the park. I'm like, you stayed in the park overnight? Mm. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, no, you're going to stay here. Like, yeah. you don't have to stay in the park. And then that night turned into another night, which turned into another night, which turned into six to nine months. <laughs> And he just, you know, he was just like, you know, he's sleeping on my couch. He yeah. was just part of, part of the furniture at that point, you know. <laughs> and I, I enjoyed having him there, mm -hmm. um, but it got to a point where he needed to go back and in, into the south and start rebuilding exactly. his career, and that's what he did. And then from there, we did a deal for him at Universal through Steve Rifkin. Mm -hmm. And it was, for me, I liked it more than the cash money deal. I was mm -hmm. more proud of that deal, even though I'm more famous for the cash money deal. Mm -hmm. I was more proud of that deal because it gave him, he was signed to Universal through Rifkin, SRC, but it gave him the right to put out his music independently. Mm. So we could release music through Selecto Hits yeah. in the down periods when Universal was focusing on other projects That's and right. other artists. And for me, that was just incredible. When it came to getting artists their deals and seeing that money coming in, how did that impact the artists and how did you feel about it? It changed their lives and it still does today. Like mm -hmm. I'm still excited. Whenever I can help somebody become a millionaire, mm -hmm. I get excited. And the last two artists that I've worked with that have really made it big, both Trouble and Little Donald mm -hmm. are both millionaires today. Come on now. And when I met both of them, they were dead broke. I remember giving Trouble money out of my own wallet so mm -hmm. he could get out of the parking garage where we met. I you know been that there, first so time, I yeah. and I remember Donald when I first met him. He was driving his girl's car, like you know. And I remember when we first first put out "Do Better," I helped him find, um, a, you know, a, a, a rental house where he could live. Mm -hmm. And I remember the look on his face when he realized that that was his mm. home, that he didn't just have to go and stay at different women's houses in order yeah. to have a place to live. Yeah. I remember when he bought his first bed and he said to me, you know, with a tear, like, this is my first bed that I've ever owned. My God. 
you know, and he was 28 at the time. Yeah. And I'm like, well, shit, I've had my own bed <laughs> my whole life. Time. Like, exactly. You know, like I, I, I just couldn't imagine being where he was from and surviving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's the excitement. Like, that's why I do this. I do this because my goal is to help people build a platform where there's their children's 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 children will still have money exactly. and they can change their lives and the lives of their communities. Mm -hmm. And they're the types of people that I'm attracted to because the, I want people that are going to make a difference just like I do. Exactly. The cash money deal. What was it like? You had already did that no limit deal. Now it's time to take some more guys well, out of New Orleans. That's that's why they came to me. That's why Cash Money uh. came to me. They wanted the no limit deal. <laughs> and the great thing was, like when they came to me in ninety seven, Master P was on his way down. Remember, he started to go play basketball. Yeah. And his empire started to decline. Mm -hmm. So I was able to use that to cash money's advantage. Mm -hmm. So I was pitching them as the new no limit, right? Ooh. And 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 Master P just fed right into <laughs> it for me, which was great, you know? Because when I was first saying it, it wasn't really true. Yeah. But what they did, they had put out 31 albums over a six year period. Mm -hmm. So they had incredible leverage. The downside was they hadn't gotten, they didn't have more than 25,000 units of sales on anything they put out. Mm. So when they came to me, I was able to restructure what they were doing, bring them into the Midwest. Cause remember I had, I had been working Twista and yeah. do or die. And you know, I, I had relationships all through the Midwest. That's right. We were able to extend their target market mm -hmm. from just Louisiana and Texas. That's right. So when I first started working with them, they were able to sell 75,000 units of the first thing that we put out together. And that just brought the labels in like shoosh. Yeah. You know, when they saw what they were able to do. This is my question now, Wendy. What is it that the labels do? Should you go from being independent to signing to a major? What is it that the labels do? I, I think it's different for each person. Like yeah. that's a really, it depends on the artist. It depends on if they like being an entrepreneur. Not mm -hmm. everybody is meant to be an entrepreneur yeah and if you're an artist that owns your own label you've got to wear many hats yeah so you've got to mm. be good at business you've got to be good at leadership you've got to be good at organizing a team yeah you've got to be good at motivating a team yeah. motivating yourself so you've got to take meetings as well as be in the studio and most artists most mm -hmm. artists can't do that most artists need to either be artists or businessmen it's exactly. very few that can really walk both sides well, very few. What was the largest amount of money you saw in one of those deals that just kind of wore you out, Wendy? Probably the cash money deal, it was a $30 million deal. How was that structured? They, were, they had the ability to bring six artists through a year. It was an 80-20 split through Universal. They owned the Masters, meaning Cash Money yeah. owned the Masters, which was unheard of. And they had a line of credit up to $10 million a year for whatever those six projects they cho chose to bring through was. And then there was also a clause in the contract where Universal had to teach their staff how how each different department See, that's that rap coalition right there. Yeah. That's that rap coalition yeah. kicking in in that yeah. contract. Talk to me, Wendy. Yeah. So if if they chose to send their staff to the marketing department, mm -hmm. they could intern with the marketing department and learn how to do it. Exactly. You know, the, the universal way, how to get to that next level That's faster. Right. What do you think about just people that maintain their independence? So I should love there it. ever be a situation to where you should stay independent or yes. should you always say, you know what, let me just go no. inside and no. So because what would be the you, perfect independent situation? If if you can if you can do everything yourself and you have a hundred percent ownership and you've already got money coming into your company so you don't need huge advances, why would you? Why would you sign to a major label, especially today? Yeah. Because Today, to be successful, you're going right to the consumer. Yeah. You're bypassing all the gatekeepers. So back then it was a little harder because in order to get to radio, you had to be signed to a label. Mm -hmm. You know, in order to get multi-million dollar budgets, you had to be signed to a label. That's right. There weren't a lot of doctors and lawyers investing in rappers back then like yeah. there are today. Right? Facts. So it was just a little bit of a different scenario. But today you don't have to do that. Today, 
you can go and get a distribution deal and 92 eight split where you're keeping 92% of all the income, you're paying 8% for somebody to go and collect your money. And then if you've got an investor who's putting up the money as your partner or some sort of a, a, a an, an angel investor who's lending you the money or whatever you can work out yeah. to your benefit. And you've got somebody on your team like myself that knows how to put out music and how to make money with the music. Why would you need a major label or even an indie label? You could be your own label. When did they start doing 92 eights? Five years ago, six years ago. And how did that change the game? It's amazing. It's amazing because yeah. you're making the lion's share of the money, but you've got to really know what you're doing. You can't like, like you can't, you couldn't just say to me, Wendy, I'm going to start a label. Let me go get a 92, eight. You've got to have some sort of a track record <laughs> okay. of success okay. of being able to put out music to get that kind of a deal. How it's did, not hard. How did the game change from analog to this new digital world that we're in? What did, what was your experience working those back rooms and stuff like that? It was when, really cool. Like uh -huh. I love the way the music industry is today because today we can go right to the fan. We don't have to go through gatekeepers. It's not yeah. about relationships the way it used to be. Mm -hmm. Now it's about, you know, does do the fans like my music and how am I going to reach them? Mm -hmm. Am I going to reach them to, to, through TikTok? Am I going to reach them from doing a show? Like, how am I going to reach the largest amount of people as possible with the money that I have allocated to do this? Exactly. And to me, it's just, it's a puzzle. It's like figuring out how we're going to reach your fans using what you have and using the music that you have. The music has to be great because mm -hmm. it's so oversaturated right yes. now. Facts. But, if you have great music and you know who your fans are and you've got the charisma and the ability and the budget mm -hmm. to reach them po properly, why not? Wendy, as a person holding down that rap coalition, meeting these people in the valley, getting them out of that valley, a lot of times that goes not appreciated at all. Most How of the time. did you keep most of the time? Yeah, most Wendy? of the time. Yeah. How do you stay focused and stay down and still stay on point? Because I know for anybody easy. being human, you'd be like, you know easy. what, fuck these motherfuckers. Yes, but remember, I wasn't doing it for the accolades. I didn't do this because I wanted to But as a human, though, you. Wendy, as a human, you see folks doing some BS and you're like, you know what, this is some BS. Why right. am I even doing this? You, this a, a human or are you a robot? I guess I guess I'm a robot because I don't have I don't have that voice in my head that says fuck this motherfucker. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like my goal is to get people out of situations and help them get into better positions and get out of the struggle, right? Like yeah. that's my goal. My goal isn't for them to say thank you or to buy me a gift for doing it. Yeah. Yes, that would be nice, but them not doing that isn't going to stop me exactly. because that's not my goal. If that were my goal, I would have stopped in 94. Thanks. You know, I would have stopped two years in like, fuck this. I'm going to go make myself a million dollars, you know, but that wasn't my goal. My goal wasn't to enrich myself or get accolades or, you know, articles or thanks. My goal was to change lives. Mm -hmm. And I have, Yeah. and that's what I focus on. I don't <laughs> focus on, the 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 people who were like fuck you mm -hmm. you know how do you feel about those people in the game as well though because you know that needs to be part of the rap coalition training as well you know <laughs> i show you how to get this money i show you how to keep this money but i also show you how to respect the people that help you do these things man i think that either that's in you or that's not mm. i don't know that i can teach good upbringing <laughs> i i think I that, that either you were raised well or you weren't yeah. or you're you know you're um a sociopath or you're not yeah i don't think that that is a teachable moment mm -hmm. being around all of the stars that you've been around what uh what are a few similarities that they all had from eminem to tupac the pimp c what are the similarities and what is it that you think makes a star and I ain't talking about no regular stuff. I'm talking about mm -hmm. hip hop Superstar. icons. You're talking about like yeah, yeah you're the big ones. Yeah. yeah, the the larger than life ones. Um, there is a drive inside of them mm -hmm. to always do better. There's an insecurity. They're tremendously insecure. Mm -hmm. There's something that's that's in them that's always 
getting them past the no, getting them past the you can't do this, getting them past the you ain't shit. Mm -hmm. It's like something, it's, it's bigger than life where they have to prove themselves. For the most part, their charisma is on 10 mm -hmm. or 12 on a scale of <laughs> one to 10. You know, the charisma is through the roof. Yeah. They realize at a young age that they can lead people. Mm. And then there's also an element of caring. Like they just care about other human beings and it's genuine. It's not fake, mm -hmm. you know, that seems to be what they have in common. Okay. That and their ability to get back up when they're knocked down. Because it's not about how many times you get knocked down. It's about do you get back up That's after right. you get knocked down. And I think most successful people, not just in rap. I mean, this applies to the Gary Vaynerchuks of the world. Yeah. This applies to LeBron James. Like anybody who's at the top of their game can get back up after they're knocked down. Who were some of the people that you saw got... Uh, knock down the hardest and get back up. And you was thinking to yourself, I don't know if you're going to be able to get back up for this one, brother. Who did, who surprised you with the get back up? I, I have to bring it back to Young Buck. Like, yeah. I'm still impressed that, like, he took that beating, right? Buck don't care. He like, going to get back he's up. He's strong, yeah. you know? Um, Pimp C, mm -hmm. Gucci Man. You know, yeah. look at look at what he's been through. T.I., look what T.I.'s been through and is yeah. going through now. Yeah. And he's going to get back up because yeah. it's in him. <laughs> Can't you know, it. either it's it, either it's in you or it's not, mm -hmm. you know, and this this game isn't for everybody, mm. you know, not everybody can win in, in the music industry and not everybody is meant to be an artist like mm -hmm. we need lawyers and accountants and, you know, um, stylists and publicists yeah. and interns even come on you know we need, get in here. yeah we need we need everything so exactly. you don't have to be famous in order to be successful in music mm -hmm. what was the time that wendy felt the most fulfilled in her work it it still happens every day Ooh. like every day i get to i just finished negotiating a deal for these two young ladies out of new york mm -hmm. and like I'm so humbled by, they don't really have leverage. And I was very nervous to do this because they don't have leverage. And their manager is a very close friend of mine and I felt obligated to help them. And I'm so glad that I did because I'm looking at their deal and while it's not the typical Wendy Day deal, it's still a great deal. Yeah. And I'm so, I'm so humbled to have been able to play a role in this. That's right. You know, I'm, I'm excited every day by my clients. You know, I, on the, on the for-profit side of what I do, people hire me to help them make money with their music. And That's I right. still get to do that every day. So it happens daily. You know, it's not, there's not one thing mm -hmm. that, that I can say keeps me going. It's all of it. Before you got into the game, you were a fan of hip hop. Mm -hmm. The reality versus the fiction. When you got in there and you saw behind the closed doors and the behind the scenes the of ugly. everything, the ugly part of it, how did that make you feel? And what was some of the things that you picked up that stuck with you when you saw yeah. it? Um, disappointed. One of the things that really stuck with me is that rappers, I saw them as heroes, as icons. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the behind the scenes, I realized that they're people. Yeah. And that was a little disappointing, yeah. especially for some of the artists that were like really my heroes, <clears throat> you know, ones that I thought thought a certain way, yeah. but then when they came out of the studio, they didn't think the way <laughs> that they did on wax. Behind the mic, yeah. Behind the mic, you know? That was really disappointing. I so I learned not to meet my heroes. In fact, mm. um, there was a point in time where I was helping CTE and I would not be in the office whenever Jeezy was, because Jeezy was my favorite rapper. And yeah. I didn't know if he was good or bad or not. To this yeah. day, I don't know. I didn't want to know, <laughs> yeah. because he was my favorite rapper. Exactly. And I didn't want to lose that adoration I that I had you. and have for him. So I remember Twin used to call me and be like, yo, we're on our way into the office, and I would head home. Because I just didn't want to be around and see, is it real or is it not real? Like yeah. I just didn't want to see that. Did you ever find yourself stressed out in the game, Wendy, over one of these deals, pulling your hair out? Probably every deal. Oh my God. Yeah, and, and how deal. do you deal with your stress, Wendy? Um, 
I used to go to the gun range a lot. <laughs> Every Saturday, I used to go to the range and, and shoot, and that that really helps. Yeah. Um. Now I watch a lot of old movies, and it's funny because if you look at the old 1930s and 40s black and white movies, mm. they're all happy. Everybody's dressed well. Nobody yells at anybody. And I watch like these fuzzy, happy, you know, um, black and white. Not necessarily all white people because there are some really great older black films too, right? Yeah. But I watch these old movies that are just from a whole other world mm. and I don't they, they don't have the confrontation and the drama and the angst mm -hmm. that you know current day drama you know TV dramas do I watch a lot of old movies and yeah. they just calm me out I feel that lastly Wendy advice for the next generation of artists what does the rap coalition have to tell these folks going forward Learn in this new digital age yes. Learn as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Like, don't jump into the pool until you learn how to swim. Yeah. Right? Because you will drown. <laughs> you know, it, just like, you know, LeBron James or Michael Jordan or whoever your favorite player is, just like they learned the game before they stepped onto the court. That's right. You have to in music too. It's not free. It's not easy. In fact, it's very expensive and it's very hard. So if you don't have the wherewithal to really to really do this properly, mm -hmm. learn how it works, see what it is, and then make the decision if you're willing to do what it takes. You gotta give up a lot to win in this industry. Can you explain to people how expensive it is yes. to be successful? Because see, you know, a lot of people still are going out here trying to fish with a shoestring and a fish stick at the end of who, it. Who told them that somebody just put you on? Like, where did that rumor get started? Because this is a really expensive, it takes millions of dollars to break an artist. And even me, like I'm 29 years into this and dude, I can't do this without a budget of at least $150,000. $150,000 to break a rapper. That's not even pop or, or R&B. That's rap, which is cheaper to work. Can so, you break down where that 150 goes? Absolutely. It goes to marketing and promotion. It goes to shooting videos, behind the scenes content. It goes to Google ads. It mm. goes to getting on playlists. It goes to everything you can imagine. And then on top of that, you've got the expense of recording. So you've got to record. You've got to buy your tracks. You can't lease them if you're trying to do this exactly. like professionally. Yeah, you've got to own the rights exactly. to the track, not not take their publishing, but you've got to own the um, ability to use that song from the producer. He's still going to own his publishing. You're going to own your publishing, yeah. but you've got to do a contractual agreement where you have the rights to that to that beat and no one else does. That's it right. has to be exclusive mm -hmm. if you're going to put money into it. You've got to have trademarks. You've got to have all sorts of contracts. You know, you've got if you have a feature from somebody, you got to have a, a you got to have that cleared mm -hmm. by their label and a contract with both parties. That's right. If you have Sam you got to clear the samples. So there's a lot of money that goes into this. And if if you're a smart boo at home <laughs> figuring out how to do this, make a list of all the ways that you're going to market and promote your music mm -hmm. and just price it out. And that's your minimum budget because you're going to have to do more than what you think you're going to do. That's right. So it's going to definitely cost you more, maybe even double of what you think it's going to cost. But you've got to figure out okay, now that I know what it's going to cost, where am I going to get that money? Where's that money going to come from? Yeah. Because so many artists start this and then they fail. And very sadly, they think, I don't have the talent for this. Mm. And it's not that they don't no, have the, the talent. Money. It's that they didn't have the money <laughs> or, the, or the work ethic, the drive. Because you've got to outwork everybody. Come on now. You've got to outwork everybody. You know, people want to believe that, you know, music is just fun time. Okay. It's not. <laughs> exactly. I, this I, is motherfucking work. <laughs> exactly. I was just talking to Wingo from Jagged Edge. She was like, hey, man, we'll get into a city, do morning radio, midday radio, afternoon drive radio. Show up at a high school, do show a meet up at and high read, school, then meet you gotta, and read. Then you got to do the show. You, gotta, you, gotta, you have sound check. <laughs> Then you gotta get dressed for the show. You gotta talk to your fans. You probably have family in that city because you've been doing this for a while. So you've got people that you've got to, you know, that you've got relationships with. You can't not see them or they'll be offended and tell you you're Hollywood. After party. 
then the after party, and then you've got four hours to sleep, and then you get up and do it all over again the next day. This is real work. <laughs> this is real work. You ain't never lied, Wendy. Lastly, how can these people contact you, though? Um, Instagram is probably the best way to reach me at Rap Coalition. Um, I've got a YouTube channel that teaches artists how to do this. Mm -hmm. It's a free channel. Um, that's youtube.com slash this is Wendy Day. And my email is at the bottom of every, not at the video, but if you scroll down mm -hmm. through the comments and the, you know, the, the caption, um, my email address is there. So you can email me directly. I can dig it. Well, Wendy, thank you so much for stopping through this thing. Thanks for having me. I can't believe we haven't done this sooner. I love exactly. you to death. I love you too, Wendy. I already yo shouted Wendy Day. We'll holler at y'all in a minute, man. We go.